Welcome to the State of the Nation. Before we kick off with our interview today, I'd like to encourage you all to subscribe to the channel. We have recently exploded in the number of uh, subscribers, and this is great. This helps us to go up in the ratings on uh, the various social media channels. Uh, we get monetized better. Uh, it allows us to do more interviews and to speak to people that really matter. So it costs you nothing. Just click the like button, subscribe, and uh, you'll be doing us a great service. You'll also get notifications of upcoming interviews. And uh, hopefully you'll get more from the channel. If you really like us, you can join our supporters club and that will have a small cost attached and you will get some, uh, some information just for you. So enough of the sales pitch. Joining me today, one of my favorite analysts, without question and yours, the numbers show, and that is Sandile Swana. Sandile, welcome back to the State of the Nation. So wonderful to have you back. Uh, thank you, Mike, and uh, I'm happy to be at the State of the Nation. It's uh, been a while since we had you here in the studio. The last time was at our live event, um, and uh, a lot's happened since then. When we uh, got together the last time, we were on stage uh, at uh, Santon Convention Center. We had many of the leaders of... Uh, of the coalition uh, the, that, that, that went to talks at Empress Palace. They came out with, uh, with an agreement, a signed agreement, and then by the looks of things went straight back to war with, it, with each other. Do you think it was a useful exercise getting those uh, people together, these uh, smaller parties or opposition parties together for those talks? Yes, I, I think that it is a major development for a few reasons. The first one being that it is an admission by leaders in South Africa, whether you like them or you don't like them, whether you call them opposition, I don't call them opposition. These are parties, uh, alternative parties, just like I don't call checkers opposition to pick and pay or spa. It's just a, a supermarket chain. So uh, it's a recognition that the ANC is beatable and the ANC is going to lose some of the major provinces in the next election. Therefore, some people have got to, to prepare themselves in some way or the other. We are not saying the Charter Group or the Moonshot Group is actually the best or the, the, the one that will succeed, but uh, uh, something different is going to come up. And the ANC itself is clearly starting to prepare itself for coalition government in any case. We know that the ANC is uh, preparing itself for elections at least. Uh, we know that whenever they start blaming everything on apartheid. Uh, we saw that in recent times where everything from fires to captured buildings in Johannesburg, uh, uh, Transnet's poor performance, Eskom, etc., um, various ministers all came out in symphony and in concert to say it was all the blame of apartheid, all the fault of apartheid. What do you make of that strategy? Do you think that strategy has legs? Uh, that strategy uh, is, is outright nonsense. Uh, I wrote an article together with uh, uh, Dr. Lumki Lemondi a few years ago. On, and, and one of the things we're doing in that article was to measure how long it takes for a country to move from third world status to first world status, if you want to use that language. And Lumki Le is uh, one of the top economists here in South Africa and on the African continent, uh, hard hitting, it takes about 30 years, one generation. So on paper from 1994 to today, we should have been comparable to Singapore. We should have been comparable to um, South Korea. We should have been comparable to uh, Finland or any other uh, well-functioning top performing country where the average household income is competitive with the best in the world. All you need is just 30 years. And even if there was the worst kind of Nazism, apartheid, colonialism, imperialism before 1994, it will still take you 30 years. Estonia is one another example that has done that successfully. So it is dishonest, intellectually dishonest, and politically uh, useless actually because the votes, regardless of what they say, from the time of the Bulukwane conference until now, the votes of the ANC are declining and declining decisively. 
Now, just uh, before we go into the actual uh, looking at the, the political landscape, let's look at that. Uh, let's let's um, talk about that uh, recovery of or, or upgrading of a country from uh, you know third world to first world status, as we call it, that or developing to a more developed country. Uh, the, the the best current example, I would imagine, and that is on a massive scale, has been India which, um, you know, and I use this example, and it's, it's an example worth, uh, worth uh, going back to, and that was in 1991, when South Africa and South African cricket was first allowed back into the international fold. Our first tour was to India, right, for three one-day internationals, and cricket mad India couldn't afford to bring the South African team out there or have the games sponsored that were madly, you know, much anticipated by the world, and the India Cricket Union couldn't afford to do that. South African companies had to sponsor it, and the advertising around the stadium were all the South African companies back then. And that was because India's economy was a closed economy. It had not liberalized. 30 years later, in India liberalized uh, their economies uh, quite soon in the early 90s. And now they're running the IPL, uh, you know, a couple of IPLs around the world, including South Africa, worth billions and billions of dollars. Uh, where did we go wrong? I, I, I think also uh, the, the case of India uh, is interesting. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a people that I learn from myself quite a lot. Uh, and there are other uh, omissions and gaps that they still create in what they are doing. Obviously, we, we as South Africans like the sporting side of things and we enjoy that. We like Tata, uh, one of the Indian companies that is here. So if you ask me where did we go wrong, um, one of the simple things, there are different approaches to this, but I will put my version on the table. My version on the table would have been that you would have wanted to create an atmosphere that promotes the creation of family-owned businesses. For instance, understand that people could create multi-million rand businesses in Soweto, in Renbeck, uh, in Krugersdorp, uh, in Umtata, and so on, uh, in, in, and, and so on. And have a culture that looks after the entrepreneurs, the professional entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and by professional, there's a difference between a tinkerer. There are people who are doing little experiments in business and people who are actually determined to do something that can be successful over a 30, 40, 50 year period. And you identify those people and work with them. And usually these are people in their 30s, 40s and 50s, not just little youngsters who are just tinkering around. So that would be one of the, of the critical uh, things. The other one would have been to focus on, on, on an Africa a development strategy. You imagine the, the opportunities that is wide open to develop electricity supply across Africa. Imagine the opportunity that is there to develop railways across Africa and roads across Africa. We had all the engineering expertise in ESCOM and elsewhere, and those opportunities are largely being taken by the Chinese. We were highly, highly regarded. Our engineering expertise was highly regarded all over Africa all over. And all of that credit has been watered down, especially since the Bulugwane Conference of the African National Congress, where uh, to be a South African engineer in South Africa, let alone in Africa, is an insult. Now, let's go back to those, uh, to those examples. Um, are you saying that the time that we've missed the opportunity to become the engineering uh, provider to the whole of Africa, the developer, of that kind of infrastructure, do you think South Africa still has the ability or do you think we don't? No, uh, bear in mind that we, we are not dead. Yes. Right? I, uh, we, we are not dead, we are still here. The people who are in class with me are still alive. The ones who came after me are still alive. Uh, and some of the people who taught us are still alive. So uh, uh, the, what has happened is that the talented, well-trained, well-experienced people have been pushed to the periphery by the gangster state. Uh, 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 for instance, the ruling party is being run by gangsters. And, and a lot of the organs of state, from director general to lower levels, are run by an assortment of criminal syndicates. 
Uh, so, so that has created a difficult, uh, there's a lot of starving engineers, a lot of starving economists, and so top class economists, who are just not being employed, who are just not being utilized, and an assortment of charlatans, chance takers, and uh, you know, workers of magic and witchcraft are the ones who are running the affairs of state in South Africa. And to go back to your first point, which is a point that resonates with me, having come from you know, worked in family businesses my whole life, nice Lebanese uh, trading stock. You know, you come along and the whole family's in the shop. You, you, you mentioned family businesses, but uh, there is uh, an inherent problem with family-owned businesses, and that is that generally, as the name suggests, it's owned by the family, and we have uh, a law in South Africa that says that other people must own portions of your company uh, if you want to do business, especially with the state. So some of our laws in South Africa preclude a family-owned business from operating. Uh, let's first of all acknowledge uh, the issue of, of family-owned businesses. Uh, and, and we have to, be, uh, to accept facts uh, without prejudice. In other words, without being angry or bitter about anything. Uh, whether you like him or not, Anton Rupert and his son are just local guys, in the true sense of the word. Uh, the Gunene brothers run a family business. They are local guys, which are started by their father, by the way, in the East End here in Gaudi. Uh, Keza Mutawung of Keza Chiefs runs a family business, uh, which is Keza Chiefs itself. A successful one, I think, in my judgment, uh, is probably running the best one of the best businesses on the African continent and what the best soccer team in South Africa. Uh, Results notwithstanding. No, you must remember that I'm talking long term. I'm yes. talking a 50 year track record here. I'm not talking about what happened last weekend or something yeah. like this. Or you know, some of you are looking at it for just <laughs> weekend to weekend. <laughs> so, Ekerman and his son and others uh, uh, have started businesses and sustained them. And when we talk about these family businesses, some are started by buddies, guys who went to university together, such as the first rent group. It's a group of, of those guys. So we have a, a long history. Maponya is a family. It's actually Richard Maponya and Chichi Maponya and his late wife. These are people you could physically meet in the streets of Joburg, uh, uh, human beings. Now, the, the issue of... of PE, maybe if that is what you want to talk about, is an economic issue, first and foremost, rather than just a business issue. What I mean by that is that there were a number of disturbances that happened in the South African economy and a number of laws that were passed to stop black people. And by black people, I mean Indians. If you study the history, the economic history of Indians in South Africa, uh, there were many laws that had to be passed one after another to stop Indians from participating in business. So, in, uh, and uh, uh, Africans as well as the colored community. So, what we then need to be aware of is that these people need to be included in the economy, in the economy as a whole. Now, as to the modalities and the mechanisms of re re reversing the exclusion, which was intentional, part of, of the state policy. As to what mechanism you actually use, it's another discussion altogether. And there are many things that are clouding uh, the political stage or the national stage for that matter for intelligent discussions to happen. Mm. Now I've heard that, uh, that, that kind of uh, ex uh, comment that you've just made many times. But there's one undeniable fact that uh, when the concern is the slicing up of the pie, you're not cooking more pies, right? The pie ain't getting bigger. You're just saying, no, guys, let's just slice it up differently. Now, South Africa obviously is, has paid the price for that. The economy is considerably smaller than what it should be. We've got anemic growth, right? Uh, and a massive unemployment rate. And um, yet the circus marches on with greater and greater... Um, um, legislation, right, uh, to the point of ridiculous where you can get a 
a mining license if you are a foreigner, but you can't get it if you're a local white South African, but that's a whole different discussion at the moment. But, uh, you know, what ignites the growth, in your opinion, in South Africa? Uh, I think we, we need to, to, to be direct about this, because uh, if you talk to serious whites in general, and I regard the white African as, as the elite of the South African economy, um, they will tell you that they made more money, actually, under the Mbeki Mandela government than previous to the apartheid government. So there are things that in the democratic era were done correctly, yes. uh, much better than previously, mm. uh, that empowered Africaners. But that momentum was terminated at the Bulugwane conference. Yes. So uh, we must not, because we're going to end up fixing the wrong problem. Mm. Uh, the minute we point the problem all over the show, uh, we're going to fix the wrong problem. The problem was kick-started uh, the economic problem that we're talking about was kick-started in the Pulukwane conference. And there are specific things that we can also remedy very quickly that were done after the Pulukwane conference. For instance, by 2005, Joel Nechitenze of the African National Congress had been mandated by the ANC and the president of the ANC to start an economic development, uh, economic uh, planning system for South Africa, which had not existed prior to that. That idea was cancelled under the Jacob Zuma regime. Uh, it has never been reborn. So when Mbeki and Padidi Huta say that the NDP, the National Development Plan, is a thumbs up, it is because it is not an evidence-based plan. Uh, we were talking about the Gassi town, Township Economy just now to say it has actually not been accurately measured uh, what goes on the sector by sector locality by locality, in order then to develop a comprehensive and cohesive economic plan. When I consulted to the Gauteng Department of Economic Development, they told me that for the first time since 1994, I want to believe, they, they have a third of the data that they need to populate their economic models, which means the, the Gauteng economy is flight, flying blind it's like a, a pilot without a computer. Fortunately, these days, airplanes have got computers. But this one, the, the computer doesn't even have the data to actually fly blind. So uh, the field of economics since 2007 has come under heavy attack in South Africa from the illiterate, largely illiterate, economically illiterate leaders of the African National Congress. On the one hand, illiterate. On the other hand, uh, members of the mafia state themselves, which they have criminal motives. So the low rate of unemployment uh, is directly related to that economics as a subject is no longer being practiced in South Africa. And of course the Gauteng uh, economic uh, um, um, uh, MEC for the Gauteng uh, economic uh, department has uh, recently appointed Des van Royenen uh, Papa Lashabani uh, uh, of Bosasa fame to, uh, to, to, to be in those particular, to run key departments. So I think we know where we're going to, which all brings us back to politics, because as you mentioned, the country is being run largely as a gangster organization. Um, we've, got, um, we've got the, the ANC um, doing some strange things. You mentioned some of the provinces. So let's dive into, uh, but before we get there, there was one other thing that I wanted to, to, to raise. We're going to get to the politics. I promise you, we're going to get to the politics in a minute. But uh, while we talk about business, there is one sector of our economy that has boomed, absolutely boomed. And that is the business of state employees um, working with the state. And you've recently done some work on that. Yeah, it's terrible. It's uh, according to the numbers that you came up with uh, within one year from 2019 to 2020, there's like a 50% growth of the number of state employees that are working with the state. Is it legal? Is it not legal? Or is it just immoral? Or is it just gangsterism? Uh, without question, first and foremost, it's gangsterism. Secondly, it is illegal. 
It is illegal because in 2014 already, laws were passed to prohibit state employees from doing business with the state. And then from there onwards, it was then prohibited from them to do paid work outside of their regular jobs. Now, if we link this back to what we we're discussing earlier on, uh, if you are a family owned business and you are doing business with the state, the person you are tendering to has a company competing with you. So who's going to win in this? You are tendering to the state. The state employee has got a company competing directly with your company. Who is going to win? So the entrepreneur who is strictly private, who is not part of the ANC, who is not part of any political machinery, he's just a freestanding entrepreneur. He or she is a freestanding entrepreneur. Uh, it's the Kuzwayo family business. They have no chance. So... Uh, all of that, the person does the inspection, he controls how the work is going to be ins inspected, he controls when the invoices are going to be paid, uh, is player and referee and goalkeeper and is the chairman of the league. That is basically, if you want to talk about things that are stifling economic growth in South Africa, the habit of politicians, elected politicians, the habit of state employees doing business here and competing with the local population and the local entrepreneurs and using state power in that competition is illegal, immoral, and totally against sound economic principles and practices that are linked to economic growth in South Africa. Do you think that our judicial um, uh, arms of the state will have any appetite to do anything about it? At this stage, as I said, and, and let me add this, that the Public Service Commission is the one that produces these statistics uh, on, the, on this topic of state employees. They themselves have tried every trick since 2014 to get the NPA involved, to get the South African police and every other type of judicial or, or, or legal uh, entity involved in this. And there are no statistics to date that show us that from 2014, these are the people who've been prosecuted, these are the people who've been imprisoned, these are the uh, people who have been disciplined and expelled from their job, and this is the money that has been recovered from these thieves. Uh, so because this is cutting across every province, every department, every level of seniority, uh, it is becoming impossible for the gangster state to start prosecuting these gangsters who operate within the state as we speak today. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's not a very complex uh, crime. It's quite no. an easy one. I get, I'm the, I get my family member to start a business or we get the contract and all I do is go to the original contractor and just double the price of that original contractor that would have done the job and pocket the difference. I don't even have to set up a formal business. I don't need to own a tractor or a grader or whatever job I'm getting because somebody is going to get paid to do it. The, the version you are putting forward is very sophisticated, by the way. <laughs> the version that we are dealing with is much more cruder than that. Okay. It's direct. Okay. So the, when they take the ID numbers of the companies that are tendering in the state and run them against the payroll of the state, in other words, these are the people who are registered on the central supplier registration database. These are the people who are registered as employees, and you compare each ID number, it pops up a, a number of them. For instance, Patricia DeLille found about uh, close to 3,700, almost 4,000 of her, her own employees in public works, when she was public works, 3,700. If you say, okay, maybe we have 30 departments or more in the national government and you multiply by 4,000, uh, what number do you get? Uh, if you then say, what about the fact that we've got provincial governments? What about the fact that we've got 700 state-owned entities? What about the fact that we've got 257 employees and you just keep multiplying by 4,000? What are you going to get? Uh, so, so the number of people who are implicated in this openly. These are ones are doing it openly, these ones I'm talking about. You are talking about ones who are trying to hide. These ones are not trying to hide. Yeah. Now, um, you know, let's just say we're heading uh, and we're going to talk about uh, the, you know, predictions and where we're going to from here on out. In the post-2024 general election world, 
would it be even possible to unravel this mystery? Because, I mean, we just won't have enough prison cells. We won't have enough judges. And uh, you'll have a colossal, massive fight back that might turn physical. You know, as, people, as we've seen in KZN with some of the construction ma mafia, where people might start, you know, dying in shootouts rather than uh, being uh, shown up for doing what they're doing. Do you think there's any danger of this, or do you think uh, it's something that we can deal with? Um, the shootouts, including the July, I think it was the July 2021 insurrection yeah. and stuff like that, those uncontrollable criminals are not uncontrollable. They are uncontrollable because the people who are in power, such as Cyril Ramaphosa and the ANC generally, are the ones who are tolerating that and actually permitting it to happen. The type of special forces trained guys in different uh, levels of complexity in South Africa who are here presently can neutralize any of these criminal gangs, any of them at any time, without any serious loss of life. So once there are guys, even if you look around your network and ask, are there any special forces, you'll be surprised the extent of expertise that is presently here and not being used. Mm. So uh, if you were to declare a 90-day state of emergency or even a six-month state of emergency and say, guys, these people whose IDs are in these databases must be removed under conditions of the state of emergency, must be removed from uh, their employment. Because in order for them to continue running tenders there, they must be removed from the office. They must not be there. They must not have that job under conditions of a state of emergency. Uh, those who are suspected that they will launch violence, they must be dealt with under conditions of a state of emergency. Then you arrest, just like doctors will tell you, that if you find a person bleeding, stop the bleeding immediately before you do anything else. Stabilize the patient. The South African patient needs a, a leader or a group of leaders who is going to say, guys, this stops and it stops now. So if you win the election in May 2024, by December, anybody whose ID is actually in both the employee, state employee database and the uh, CSD as a supplier to the state, that person must know that their employment is ended. We're not yet talking about sending them to jail. And you set up courts. There are many retired judges and advocates who are not fully employed. You set up courts to say, in each province I have 100 advocates who are working every day to actually process these cases. And you stipulate time frames within which a case must be finished. Each case must be finished within this. And the evidence is there. This person has already broken the law and the databases are proving it. Yeah. Well, we'd have to get our ex-president, uh, Sepp Blatter, from FIFA to run the country in order to get that uh, done that you mentioned, because that's the only time that it has been done in modern South Africa. But let's look at, uh, at this must have political implications in both directions, because there's some people that couldn't bear to see the status quo change. Yes. Right, because that's going to be the end of their livelihoods. And it's not just them, it's extended families, groups, etc. There's a lot of people, yeah, if we're talking by my sort of uh, mental calculations, hundreds of thousands of people, mm -hmm. each one affects many, that's probably, you know, half a million voters that, that couldn't bear the idea of, of uh, these criminal, uh, criminals being out of their jobs. But there's been a lot of political development recently that we haven't uh, had a chance to talk about. Um, we did have the passing on of Mangasutu Butelezi from the IFP. Uh, do you think that uh, that helps the IFP or harms the IFP, or do you think it's a non-issue? Um, I think it, on the one hand, it does help the IFP. Uh, I think at the time when Zondi, the Reverend Zondi, was emerging as a leader in the IFP, that probably should have been the time that Mango Sutu started to step back and took ceremonial opportunities. Mm -hmm. I am not uh, worried. Uh, I, let me say I give credit to Mango Sutu Butelezi for his education and training. The guy was just competent. 
uh, in terms of public administration. That you cannot take away from. But in terms of being a life president of the IFP, that was a far-fetched idea. Yeah. Uh, there are youngsters, even now in the IFP, very capable. And, and they've got to understand that the IFP now has got to be organized as a professional, if there is ever such a thing, professional, modern political party that recognizes young talent and professional talent and moves on on that basis. They have a lot of potential. Uh, whether they are going to be able to capitalize on that potential, it's another issue altogether. Well, we recently spoke to uh, Velenkosini at Clubisa, and he certainly sounded like a different guy. You know, he sounded like a leader. He said all, uh, all the right things, and one hopes, uh, you know, to see that through. Because one of the trends that we have seen in recent by-elections is a complete reversal of fortunes for the ANC and the EFF in KZN. So now that we've got uh, a change in the IFP, they've been part of those multi-party talks and they've done really well in some of the, the recent by-elections. Could you see a situation where the ANC loses control of KZN? Uh, yes, that situation is foreseeable. You must remember that uh, if you look at it from a historical point of view, the ANC never won KZN until Jacob Zuma became president of South Africa. When Jacob Zuma became president of the ANC and potentially therefore president of South Africa and so on, that alone brought in about, I think if I remember the figures correctly, 1.5 million new voters. That alone, that event alone. When Jacob Zuma was kicked out of office, they lost half a million voters. Immediately. So that is one factor. Other than the other factor of uh, the IFP reviving itself because the IFP also got into confusion and splits and other things that they did and they, that cost them votes and the IFP has started to demonstrate that they are able to revive themselves with or without the DA by the way uh, uh, which, is, which is what makes the politics of KZN very interesting because the IFP has got an appeal of its own in KZN without anybody's support yes. so and the ANC on the cultural ticket, the ANC has been weak. The only person who has been able to flip things in favor of the ANC has been Jacob Zuma. They've never had, uh, let's say since the days of uh, Lutuli, they've never had a genuinely, uh, you'll forgive me for this language, a genuinely Zulu uh, ANC leader. Yeah. They've never had that. Let's turn our attention to the Western Cape where there is uh, some question about uh, the DA holding the, the impact of the Patriotic Alliance in some of the more rural uh, Western Cape areas. Uh, it seems like they do have appeal within that market. Do you think it's going to be significant enough to threaten the DA's control of the Western Cape? The, the control of the DA of the Western Cape is already under threat. And the... the the, the, I, don't want, I don't know whether we can find a nice word, but they fired Delil. Yes. Uh, but probably Delil was one of the remaining elder states persons of the so-called colored communities in, the, in South Africa for that matter. Probably she's still the most senior politician here now in, with all the credentials that go with that. That cost vote. Uh, Mackenzie, this uh, PA leader, appeals to another different type of voter, the younger voter, uh, with his colorful history. The, and, and, and that history of criminality and all sorts of things, the second chance, this, that, and the other. And speaking truthfully to the fact that the so-called colored communities has been neglected by both the DA and by the ANC. The way they kicked out, the ANC kicked out Rasul out of power in the Western Cape was disgraceful and remains disgraceful till today. So a uh, uh, good uh, uh, idea, whatever they call themselves, and Mackenzie are going to give the DA a walloping there. We only have to wonder because the statistics have been pointing downward for the DA at any rate. And by the way, the Freedom Front Plus 
is also going to start biting at the heels of the TA. Yeah. And the one thing that's clear is that despite uh, the, the protests to the contrary, Kate McKenzie is just going to support the ANC every time, isn't he? I mean, there seems to be no doubt about it. He always says he hates the ANC and then he always uh, sort of goes into coalition with them. And I've had him on the show and pressed him on it before. And he's got a very sort of charming way of, uh, of uh, trying to deny it, but the facts uh, are the facts. Yes, the, the, and, and, and I don't think he, he has a realistic uh, opportunity of partnering with the DA except demanding a pound of flesh from the chest of the DA. Mm -hmm. And the DA is not prepared to give that pound of flesh from there. So I think he's got a better chance, 80% chance of going with the ANC. Which then brings us to Gauteng, which is also in play. Uh, we've seen Panyaza Lesufi using every trick in the book, uh, some that even skirt the, 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 the sort of bounds of legality. But this man's not going to stop it using any trick possible to try and retain uh, uh, Gauteng. Do you think it's going to happen? No, he's not going to retain Gauteng. And, and, and Panyaza Lesufi, I like him. I'm a, I'm a Sowetan by birth. When he talks, you know, he talks like a homeboy. I, I like the way he talks. But he plays for the losing team, unfortunately. Uh, and you see, the people of Gauteng are, I want to say, standard bearers in South African politics. You are not going to convince the people of Gauteng to hang around with you when you put them in poverty. And the ANC has been consistent in introducing poverty in Gauteng across the board. They have been consistent in undermining the infrastructure that supports the economy of Gauteng. We've reached record levels of unemployment and poverty under the ANC. And there's no way of hiding it. You cannot hide it by hiring 6,000 uh, so-called guards, this, that, and the other. Uh, because people already know that in their suburbs, and uh, I live in the farming areas, that the security is gone. The security we have now is from the private sector companies. And even when the private sector companies have done their job, you cannot get the police to finish it off. We can't even protect ESCOM infrastructure because the police are not coming board. We can't even control land invasions and trespassing because the municipal police and the provincial police and the SAPS are not interested in that. So the title deeds are becoming worthless uh, as things stand. And the people of Gauteng will never accept that. These, this is probably one of the most money conscious places on the African continent. These are not people who will support you because you are the DA, by the way. If what you are saying sounds good to their pockets or they see what you are doing is going to be good in their pockets, They'll go with you. That is why I initially thought Mashaba was a good man for us on the money side, which is the main business of Gaudi. Unfortunately, the DA and the ANC, according to Mashaba's report, colluded to kick him out. Yeah, which sort of brings us to the bigger picture, and that is we are uh, you know, less than a year away from elections. Um, as we head to the end of 2023, we know what the election cycle looks like. We started off by saying we know it's election near, nearing when the ANC starts blaming everything, their shortcomings on apartheid. They've got a couple of months, they're still the people in charge. We're going to see load shedding suspended, one would imagine, around the election time in the hope of uh, pumping up votes. Do you think there's anything that the ANC can do now to save themselves? Look, uh I'll use something that I believe uh, is, is data that comes from a, a person who's focused on the sector for a long time, uh, 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 Anthony Tertin from the University of Free State, and he also worked for the CSIR before, on the issue of water and sanitation. For instance, you must accept that the cholera that uh, impacted the people of South Africa in Hamanskral and elsewhere was not cholera that came from England or some other from Mars. It came from the mismanagement of water supplies in South Africa. The correction of the problems that have been created in the water infrastructure in South Africa 
will take 10 to 15 years to bring it back to a basic function, a stabilized function. It's not going to take the six months to make. Okay? Similarly, the problems we have created and continue to escalate every day by stealing infrastructure, undermining ESCOM through criminal methods, uh, that problem is also going to take another 10 years to 15 years to resolve. You hear all the fantasies going around uh, that, yeah, you'll put a stick in a battery over here and stick in a wire over there and the thing will light up. Then nothing like that. It's going to take a long time to resolve. And just uh, in closing, the one party that we haven't spoken about is the EFF. Um, they had their, 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 their 10th birthday bash, fireworks, dances, uh, men on platforms and lifts and all sorts of things. It, it looked quite impressive. But their performance at by-elections has been spotty uh, at best and poor in some areas. Do you think that uh, their appeal will grow? Do you think they'll benefit from uh, a fallout with the ANC? Or what, do you, what are you looking at for the EFF going ahead? Uh, I think the EFF, the two parties that I'm confident, uh, whether you like them or not, that I think are going to do well next year, the Freedom Front Plus and the EFF. Uh, yes, I know some of you don't like them, but I think those two are going to do well. Uh, Gwede Mandashe is circulating on social media, scolding the youth league of the ANC, that they want 50% of the positions in every structure, the, the members of the provincial legislature, members of parliament, 50% must come from the youth league. And Mandashe says, you guys have lost all the SRCs in South Africa to the EFF, which is true. So the students, when the elections were voting, the EFF won. The EFF has also done something new, which is to start winning wards, uh, contesting a ward and winning. You know, um, the, the, here in Joburg, the EFF for a long time had no ward. All their seats were proportional representation seats. So if you wanted a ward councillor, it would be a DA ward councillor or an ANC ward councillor in the main. So the, the, this is a side issue. I believe the PA has also won a award, I think, in Eldos or something like that. So, so to me, there are signs that, uh, bear in mind that they will still get the proportional seats. And there are certain ones, it appears, that they are starting. They may not be a lot, but they are not there. The EFF doesn't need to grow dramatically because the other, the bigger parties are, are declining. So if you are smaller than them and you grow marginally, it's a big growth when we are growing against someone who's declining. Well, there we have it from Sandile Swana. A very, very, very interesting story that's busy playing out in real time. We thank you so much for sharing your analysis with us today to everybody. Um, I'm sure you enjoyed listening to Sandile. Always a, a man in the know and his analysis is usually spot on. We actually have got a big announcement, and that is Sandile is going to be joining us for a live State of the Nation business breakfast at the Santon Convention Center for those of you who are in uh, the Johannesburg area. Uh, we'll put information down at the bottom of this, uh, of this uh, video, and uh, that's going to happen at the end of November. So to Sandile Swana, thank you so much for joining us today. To everybody out there, we look forward to seeing you again on the State of the Nation and subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much.